Who, if elected to Congress, could be the youngest man in Congress. Ricky, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks so much, Brian. My name is Ricky Gill. I'm a candidate for Congress in the San Joaquin Valley in the 9th Congressional District. Uh, that's Stockton, Lodi, Brentwood. A little bit about my background. I'm a first generation American. I'm born in the Central Valley, which is feeling an immense amount of economic hardship. Um, I served on the State Board of Education, which was my first public policy profile. It was there that I learned. Uh, really, the hard way. That you were like 18 when you were 17. 17. <laughs> 17. Talking about, talk about pushing the age envelope. This is a recurring theme. Yeah. Um, but point being, the students were the one interest group that didn't have an organized lobby in Sacramento. So, student-centered educational reform is one of my big passions. We're bringing it to this congressional race. Um, I've been involved in my family's small business for quite some time. Uh, you know, even before age 21, I was involved with wine red growing business. So, um, I'd like to talk to you about that. But thanks so much for attending. So prior to the age of 21, you could grow it, but you couldn't drink it. That's right. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks for being here. It's out of kilter with the rest of California and the rest of the United States. So obviously this whole idea of jobs, when you're out there talking to people about jobs and the economy, what's your message to get them to listen to a young guy like you? You're 25, okay? How, how, why should they listen to what you have to say? Well, I think we're very well poised to have a discussion on these issues. Um, when you talk to the younger generation, uh, and in my case, it's a, it's a perfect identity, um, there's something compelling to be said about the national debt. You know, when I'm traveling the district that I seek to represent at some point, um, a lot of folks are seeing that austerity in their own life. Everyone's tightening their belt. But the federal government really has it. The runaway reckless spending has continued unabated. And that, to me, is out of kilter. As bad as the economy is, that's something that's tough to justify. So, you know, in this campaign, we're talking about a balanced budget government that's smarter, uh, limited, smaller government. Um, it's something that um, I think appeals to the younger generation because there are generations of taxpayers that are not even born yet that are going to bear this debt. I also think, you know, the zeitgeist, if you will, around younger Republicans is really about what you're seeing it uh, in a variety of movements, even at the presidential level, is more freedom, more opportunity, uh, individual accountability. And so if we as a party are talking about uh, you know, balanced budgets, if we're talking about regulatory relief, which is a big issue for farmers, but also a big issue in the Silicon Valley, we can be the party that reaches new demographics. And, and building the appeal of the party is one thing we can do. I think our campaign for Congress is a great test case for that. You know, we're young, uh, and in a way, to speak to Joe's concern about branding, we are trying to rejuvenate the brand in that district. Um, and I think through the vector of, you know, having a good story, you can reach new people. You've got to have candidates who know how to reach these ethnic communities. Being young helps. Uh, and being fresh, I think, is an unqualified good thing. We had a really great Latino town hall earlier today. It was big rating. It was fun to listen to some of the discussions that were taking place. And I know some of you were able to be part of that. So, Javier, I just ask you this question based on all this. You know, the job market, terrible. The economy and the tank. But what you stand for our entire party, um, you know, when you when you talk about education as an issue, um, it's painfully obvious that you know there's a, one party in this state that is an amalgam of special interests in education. There's one party where we can actually accept this as a social justice issue. You know, we can actually talk about equity for a change. We can be that party on education, right. and it's another opportunity we're missing in other states. I mean, California is where, unfortunately, our party's been kind of locked out of the public policy process. But if we were to make steps, appropriate steps on education, I think we could energize new constituencies, appeal to these new demographic groups that we need to desperately. Uh, it's a way of exhibiting uh, a degree of compassion, but also what's right for our economy. And, and that's something we see in California. You know, it's pretty pathetic. When you look around the various uh, school districts in the state of California, and you start to see the actual numbers, kids entering high school as a freshman, and how many, what percentage actually graduates as seniors, you know, in some school districts, it's 50% graduation rate. That's pathetic given the fact that in California, we spend more per, per pupil than any other state in the union. So that's a real problem that needs to be addressed. What do you think we should be doing about that? What do you, where in do you think the problem lies? Right? So it's not exclusively spending. In fact, there's a great article about this recently. I think it was in The Economist magazine. They looked at Jeb Bush's Florida education reforms. Florida does not spend as much as other states do per pupil, but they're getting great results. And it's because there's been top tier reforms done there in terms of teacher pay, uh, making sure that you know uh, we have student choice that is really enabled. Indiana's experimenting with a lot of this. 
Um, the real problem in a state like California is we don't have the critical mass of charter schools that we need. Um, if you read back to the charter school statute from 1992, in a way before my time, Ryan, but one thing that you, you'd appreciate is that uh, the goal was to take the best practices from charter schools and apply them to regular public schools right. or to create a critical mass. We're not there. Um, and this is an issue that really um, allows us to be um, kind of the bigger tent party, if you will. And um, there are a lot of kids that we're just losing in the education crisis. I see it every day. It's a real, it's a real painful thing. In a city like Stockton, which people have written about and, uh, and, and unfortunately dismissed, which is the heart of this crisis, which is about to go bankrupt, yeah. which could go bankrupt, unfortunately, because of a failure of leadership. Uh, what you're seeing now is you know the high school dropout crisis. I actually have young people come up to me saying, Ricky, I'm not sure I should even stay in high school because I have to supplement my father's income. You have all these things coming to a head. Uh, there's a real opening for us. You know, We just don't have to be resigned to the fact that we're lose losing certain groups. Javier, I'm going to ask you a question in just a moment regarding this. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience in just a moment as well. Who's got the traveling microphone, by the way? Okay, you're one of those? Okay, so we'll uh, take oh, their aptitude. We have a lot of friends who do Teach for America, and they're unfortunately on the shopping block, even though they have the most merits, that's a potential issue. The second one is technology. Um, the reason why, and I think it's a great thing that our party is not, we're not the special interest party on education, right? We're about the students. Issue like technology is thoroughly liberating for students. No matter who you are, you can have 30 kids in the same classroom, you can have individualized uh, student plans. It puts the onus on the teacher to really be accountable, in a way. Um, and we should be the party that's providing that. The impetus for technology can come from us. Um, and that's another way for us to be forward thinking uh, and see if this issue by the course. Question from the audience. Let's get this. It's perhaps the greatest accountability mechanism we have in public education. We need more of it. Well, it breeds, it breeds competition. Yeah, which is also what we need in healthcare, frankly. I mean, it's mind boggling that you can't buy health insurance, for instance, across state lines. We have in these markets in a way that depresses accountability. We need more of it. So and that's the spirit of the question. Excellent. Over here, let's get a question. Talk about balanced budget requirement. Here's another one to piggyback off what uh, some of my colleagues are saying here. Um, if you look at serious regulatory reform, I mean, something I talk to young people about all the time, streamlining regulations. Here, here are two really serious federal proposals that I, I'm talking about, um, which resonate with people across the map, including young entrepreneurs. I mean, most people don't realize this, but it's true. So much lawmaking in Washington happens through the back door through the regulatory bureaucratic process. You know, one thing I talked about is all these major federal rules, if they're having a significant impact on the economy, we should switch the default. Congress owes us an up or down floor vote on these issues. Another one is when you look at how an agency proposal, proposes a rule, they typically do a cost-benefit analysis. Well, one of the costs should not just be the compliance and the paperwork. It should be how many, what's the job situation going to be impacted as a result of this? You know, we should incorporate job losses as part of these costs, too. It's a way to slow down the regulatory, you know, train wreck or that's basically running a month right now. Uh, and that's another way to appeal to young entrepreneurs and our instinct for freedom and, and liberty. It's, a, it's probably the third dividend issue, but it's a big one to talk about. Question back here. Yeah, so you can't it. Here's another one. You know, a lot of, a lot of liberals and progressives will talk about uh, other countries in terms of international law and how they're structuring things and saying, oh, we should take a page out of their book. Well, another thing we can look at is other countries, and uh, particularly in the Eurozone, look at their regulatory apparatus and, and kind of see where, where ours, if ours benchmarks match up with theirs. Because we live in this competitive global dynamic where uh, you, know, you can vote with your feet or businesses can move to regulatory environments that are more conducive. And if we're out of kilter, well, we are going to suffer. So it's important to at least Undertake that analysis too. Uh, see how we're matching up relative to other environments economically. So see what you you, uh, you didn't have to experience because again, I think your story is remarkable. You Javier, you homeschool, start with it does require you know in some ways a whole new way of thinking. Uh, I think you're right that there needs to be a greater connection between the ground and, and, and sort of party hierarchy. Um, look, let's. Let's start with some simple reforms, which is not spend more money than is coming into the federal treasury. There's nothing novel about that. Let's uh, let's put more sunset provisions on federal laws. You know, President Reagan used to say that the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a federal program. <laughs> so let's turn limit our laws, right? Let's uh, phase them out. I, I love when 25 year old guys quote Reagan. That's just great. That's great. Well, it's born during his presidency, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
So, you know, look, it's a whole new way of thinking, but um, supporting the entrepreneur, you know, fighting the out of control regulator, supporting, you know, the patient and the patient physician relationship rather than the bureaucrat, focusing on the student as opposed to the other organized interests, these are those issues that are going to allow us to really define this party in a positive way. That's the messaging. The other part is just, is the messaging. You know, as a party, we do need to be recruiting candidates who are going to play to a brighter image for this party. I mean, what, what Joe said is absolutely right. Branding is inextricably tied to how successful we're going to be as a party. It really is. And right now, we lost the branding wars, but we lost, let me take that back, we lost the branding battles. We, we have been. We haven't necessarily lost the war yet. There's, there's time to take that back. So uh, I know in our campaign, we're trying to answer that as well. You know, if I could just to follow on that, because I, I think. Mean, <laughs> this resume is as thin in the paper you see. If you ever get like a, a, if you own a stock and they send you their <laughs> annual report, and the first three pages are a nice paper stock and it's all glossy and people going on vacations and living large, and then the next 98 pages are onion skin. <laughs> McNerney's resume is like one of those pages. It's onion skin. There's nothing there. Ricky has a real chance to beat this guy. And he really is a kook. He's actually stalked me uh, publicly because I had some things to say about him on the radio. I get stalked too, Brian. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> I think this is, one, this is one congressional district that can really flip. You would be the youngest congressional representative in, in Washington, D.C., and the youngest we've had in many, many years. So this right. is a real opportunity. If I can just add to what Brian's saying, um, a lot of people ask me. have to pay me for the extra time. That's right. A lot of people uh, ask me about the urgency of this campaign because, you know, we're pushing the age envelope. This was, this was a very organic campaign, and if you'll allow me just this one brief digression, the reason I'm running in the 9th Congressional District, this is a Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley District, we are so underrepresented. I mean, think about this district with double the national unemployment rate. There's actually not a single state or federal legislative representative who lives in our Congressional District today. I mean, not one. So there's no input into the process in Sacramento or in Washington. And that's where I mentioned my opponents from the Bay Area, and now he's got to run in the Central Valley. Twitter questions. How many Twitter questions? I want to see a Twitter question. Okay. I'm noticing comments from our various uh, panelists here. Yeah, it's actually we can gather some. Okay. Okay. Here, here's a Twitter question. Right in here. Microphone, please. Here you go. Uh, this one was uh, tweeted by Scott Carpenter. Who is a young up and comer in the national stage you youth GOP can learn from as a defender of our principles? Ricky Gill. <laughs> You're right, you did it. I think of this, of our of our of the four candidates we currently have, who seems to resonate most with your peers? This isn't an endorsement, I'm just asking you a question. Of, of the folks that you're you know hanging out with who are are gonna be voting and are thinking about voting Republican, which one of those four candidates seems to garner the most support? In my neighborhood definitely Ron Paul. Ron Paul? Okay. Don't, don't no, say Ricky. Don't say Ricky. <laughs> Ricky, you're on the hot seat. This isn't an endorsement. It's not an endorsement. I'm just asking. Well, listen, I, I think it obviously depends upon kind of uh, what matters to you most. I think for those of the libertarian stream, uh, those who are concerned about monetary policy, potentially being out of I think it would be uh, Carson Paul. For those who are really interested in someone who has a deep private sector experience, um, Governor Romney appeals to some of those folks too. And so it's Kevin Dunn is exactly a scientific example on this thing. Well, you know, I think uh, it, it really... ...which we're going to hear today. Um, and, and I think connecting it to something that is more here now, which is job loss. I think when we have the government spending the way they are, you know, eventually it's going to be impacted by the credit markets, which affects the small business ability to meet payroll or expand payroll. So, you know, that connection needs to be made. Um, and ultimately, you know, the onus is on those of us who are crazy enough to do this to make that...
best stimulus plan to get everyone back to work so that young people and professionals can start their careers is to fire Barack Obama and save this country. Are you with me? for young professionals. You know, when you've got 25% unemployment rates for people between the ages of 18 and 24, that's a president that didn't deliver on his promises. Now, I happen to believe that we're in a battle for freedom in this country. This is what this election is about. I love this party. I'm the chairman of the party. I love the party. But this is not about the future of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. This election is about the future of America. We are about to spend, when my son is my age, 43 cents, 43 cents on every dollar made in America just to run the federal government. Now that's a battle for freedom. It's a battle between government's insatiable appetite to grow and what's born in every American's heart, which is the pursuit of individual and economic freedom. It's the very idea of America that's at risk in this election. And young professionals, people my age, couples like me and my wife, and, and, and people your age, we love this country. We want to put America back to work. And it starts with our college students and, and, and people just out of school. And we've got to do a better job talking about it, quite frankly. And I want you to know that if you look at the horsepower in this country, politically, it's with the Republican Party. My best friends in politics, the two guys that I grew up with, are Paul Ryan and Scott Walker. Now, we've got, we've got a lot of great young guys and, and gals in California, too. And Devin, Kevin McCarthy. I mean, obviously, I don't want to start listening, but you know what? If you look at the horsepower in this country, politically, they're with the Republican Party. So we've got a better message. We've got better messengers. But as a party, we've got to do a better job of connecting the dots on our college campuses, getting out the vote with absentee ballots, voice over internet phones, voter to voter contacts. And we need to start measuring it. I mean, it's one thing to be good at giving a speech and talking about these things. But we need to start proving it. Because anyone can start talking about it. Quite frankly, I'm sick of talking about it. So what we need to do, as a party, is to be functional, operational. We need to raise money so that it's coming out of our windows. And then what we need to do is start having victory centers and programs on college campuses regionally, have both paid people in those centers so that we're not just relying on organic volunteer growth, which you need to do, but we need to start hiring people and holding those people accountable for the door-to-door -door campaign, bringing people to, to, to the, to the campus, from the campuses to the polls, getting the absentee ballots out, so that we say, okay, you've got to get out 2,000 absentee ballots in this region in the next two days. How are you doing? We have voice over internet phones and a dashboard in Washington or in Sacramento or wherever, wherever it's at. We can see whether that Victory Center is performing. What I'm talking about is connecting the dots, not just being good at talking about it. So listen, every one of us in this room, we've all been blessed in different ways. Every one of us. And we may not agree on every little detail and every little thing. Of course not. But in the end, the one thing we agree on is if we don't want to see America destroyed, then we need to fire Barack Obama, and that's going to bring us all together. So with that, thank you, and God bless you. Have a great Get back to our panelists. We've got a little bit of time left. Joe, you actually had a really great question. Can I allow you to just articulate that to these guys? Um, okay. You know, happened, I would say, over the next, over the past 15 to 20 years, which can, um, again, be a um, potentially a democratic dividend, lowercase d, democratic dividend for freedom loving people around the world. We have all these multilateral organizations that can 
pick up the slack for us. Admittedly, you know, we can't do the policing for every part of the globe. We just can't do it. It's not, uh, it doesn't fit with the national treasury. It might not fit with our overall sense of national purpose. But for example, look, look at Africa. Um, there, there's the African Union there to uh, manage potential hotspots. It doesn't have to be U.S. troops on the ground. So there is a connection between foreign policy uh, you know, and, our, and our federal treasury, and we need to manage our responsibilities the right way. And uh, I think you know, the younger generation really will appreciate the fact that uh, you know, these organizations can pick up the slack for us, and, uh, and it's something that you know, we can readily deploy to our benefit, not to our detriment. Yours is a generation that saw 9-11, you know, you were, you were young kids, okay? Uh, those images are actually the mine, but and since then we've been involved in a couple wars. So talk to us about that part of the equation when it comes to your generation and, and their thoughts about our security, knowing there are entities like Al-Qaeda and others who have us in the crossroads. Well, I, I would be surprised if everybody out there 